I welcome you into the worship service. I am so glad you have chosen to share this time with your church family. And I do pray this will be a meaningful worship experience for each one of you. We have flowers today in honor of somebody who's not able to be here. It's in honor of the faithful service of Paula Wynn. This was to be, and she's supposed to be sitting right there. Uh, her sister has COVID, and she is feeling fine. She doesn't think she has it, but out of caution, she decided not to come. This, she is on loan to Mount Carmel, where her father is a stated supply pastor, but I, she can't stay forever. I told her that. She has to come back eventually, but we will get the flowers to her. And a birthday today, Ann Gentry is ignoring her birthday. So now I'm, I'm in her bad graces <laughs> for mentioning that. Happy birthday. Uh, we do, we would like to know who's worshiping with us. So and you all know about the attendance forms. Uh, there will be no choir practice following worship. We make mats for the homeless and more on Monday, Weight Watchers on Tuesday, two birthdays on Tuesday. Lonnie Gret is celebrating her birthday. And I know Susan Winters is here, but she's not in worship, I don't think. She must be working, but it's her birthday. She was in Sunday school. Uh, intercessory prayer Wednesday, evening study. I'm really enjoying the study. Uh, Wednesday night. That's a fun group. We're all so smart. Oh, an anniversary on Wednesday. Blake and Paula. Congratulations, Paula, for putting up with Blake for all of those years. And, oh, Wayne is having a birthday on Thursday. There you are. I, oh, that's neat. And y'all are getting ready to leave, aren't you? Going someplace? Two weeks. Uh -huh. And have fun. Enjoy. Tell him we said happy birthday. Oh, Carlton is celebrating his birthday. Yeah, he, Ann, and I all ignore our birthdays. Oh, uh, Two adult Sunday school classes, just a reminder, and have uh, three announcements, things coming up in the next month, and we would like to have your support in each one of these, and I'll ask Teresa McKendrick if she would come forward and talk about, where is Teresa? I do that every time. We are going to once again be partnering with Grace Lutheran Church to collect food for Thanksgiving baskets. Um, some of you know that Grace Lutheran offer, operates a food pantry year round and maintaining that food pantry for them is a challenge. I spoke to someone a week ago and they said what used to cost through second harvest a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars is now two thousand to twenty five hundred dollars just to maintain their pantry. So on top of that they know all of the people. They have vetted the people, so they know the people. And they try to do at least 26 Thanksgiving baskets, and they also do Christmas baskets. So our contribution this year will be both items of food and monetary. There will be a list like this on the bulletin board. There will be boxes starting next week in the, or October 6th. It's going to go October 6th through the 23rd. And there will be boxes in the fellowship hall that you can put the food in. We will, missions will transport the food to Grace Lutheran and they will put together the uh, boxes. We would like for, uh, to try to maintain a monetary contribution because they have to buy the meats and the fruits and vegetables and the perishables along with the feeding the canned stuff that they use. But an interesting thing they do, and this is one reason why I've enjoyed being a part of this, they don't just provide one meal. When those families get a box, they get two weeks worth of food in that box. So you're not only helping provide a meal 
for a holiday, you're helping a family sustain for two weeks. So if you have a, write a check and put it in the offering plate, just make sure you, you can write it to the church, but make sure you note it for Thanksgiving baskets, or you can put um, cash in an envelope and drop it in. But I'll be um, reminding you as time goes on how we're doing with our Thanksgiving drive. Thank you. I'm going to ask Paula Shelton. I don't have a picture for this one. <laughs> But Paula has an announcement she would like to make about a fellowship opportunity. The Fellowship and Activities Ministry is going to do a kind of a church picnic, but we're going to do a picnic at the church. And um, in lieu of having one uh, as we normally do in the summertime, we're hoping that we'll have better weather this way. We're going to have it on October the 15th at noon, which that is a Saturday. It is Bama Saturday. We're hoping they'll play later in the evening because the time is to be determined. Blake suggested we call it the Beat Bama Picnic, but we have a couple of Bama <laughs> fans in the crowd, so we can't do that. Um, but anyway, the ministry will provide fried chicken and um, all of the beverages, and we're also going to set up some games, bingo, maybe some cornhole, maybe even a cakewalk, I don't, some things the kids will enjoy. So bring your favorite side dish for a picnic and uh, plan on coming and joining us for a couple of hours. And wear your UT stuff. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding, Paulette. Okay, John, would you come up and tell us about our family following? <laughs> <Are you not>? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's banned. Yeah.
Thanks. Are there any other announcements? Let us worship God. Our call to worship is taken from the fifth chapter of Ephesians where Paul writes, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Let us pray. Almighty God, we're here waiting expectantly for your presence to fill our hearts and your wisdom to fill our minds. Wash away everything that will keep us from feeling your presence and receiving your word to us today. We want to understand what your will is for our lives, our families, our church, and our nation. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. number 88 come thou almighty king
The children are invited to come forward for their special time. And for those of you who may not know Duncan, he is Amelia's big brother, son of Blake and Paula Shelton. But most importantly, he is a candidate for the ministry under the care of East Tennessee Presbytery. Yay! Morning. It's on. There we go. Okay. I'm going to sit because that's what I grew up doing. Is that okay, Larry? All right, cool. Hey, guys. How are y'all? I'm good. Like you said, my name's Duncan. I'm Amelia's big brother. She uh, did this with y'all last week. And I know I'm a new face and probably won't be as good as the Wind Sisters, but I'm going to do my best. So if you guys could ask for any one thing in the world, what would you want? If you had one wish, what would it be? I hear a lot of oohs in the audience. A lot of them are thinking real hard. Would you guys wish, wish for toys or talent, some skills that you don't already have yet? Y'all are still young. Y'all got plenty of time, unlike my parents. Um, can't teach an old dog new tricks. Um, <laughs> some people here might wish for money or maybe a big fancy house. How many of you guys would wish for wisdom? Do you think you'd want to ask for that? So what is wisdom anyways? And how can we be wise? So if I look or act smart or say important things, does that make me wise? Maybe I read some very fancy, fancy sounding facts and information. Is that wisdom? Well, not really. You see, wisdom is not about what you know but it's about who you know and the experiences you have been through. Wisdom is about our ability to use our minds in ways that help us serve God and make good decisions. How do we do that? How do we make positive choices? For instance, and this is something I'm bad at, let's say you need to choose between eating candy and an apple. You'd choose the apple? Well, you're better than me. You would too? Well, man, y'all are doing better than me. The candy sounds very, very appealing in the moment. You know, nice bar of chocolate, for instance. But we probably know that it would be the most healthy choice in the long run to choose the apple. Wisdom could help us see that the fruit, the apple, is the better option. But there are much harder and more important decisions that will come later in your lives. Wisdom is what we call discernment. That's what wisdom is about, discernment. Being able to tell what might be better or worse choice for us. God wants us to be wise, and the Bible tells us that we should not act foolishly or make choices too quickly, but we should use wisdom. So the Old Testament tells us of a, of a man named Solomon. Solomon was King David's son, and he took over as king after David died. One night, God came to Solomon in a dream, and he offered Solomon anything he wanted. Now, the king could have requested treasures or herds of llamas or other cattle, but no. He chose wisdom, and that's what God wanted him to choose. He knew, Solomon knew, that he would be challenged as king. And he wanted to make sure he was making the right choices for both his kingdom and the people that he ruled. So that's what he asked for. He asked for wisdom. And God liked that answer. He told Solomon that he would give him wisdom. And also, he would have riches and beautiful things. God wanted Solomon to want wisdom. But unfortunately, Solomon would make some mistakes later on in his life. He started getting a little too caught up and his riches, and his relationships, and he forgot where all of that wisdom and treasure came from. It came from God. When he tried relying on himself instead of God, things slid downhill, and we can ask God for wisdom too. He wants to hear from us as his dear children. He promises to be present with us and to give us what we need, including wisdom to make good decisions. True wisdom does not come from a textbook, but from the good book the book, the Bible. 
It contains the very words of God. He gives us wisdom through the pages of Scripture and through what Jesus taught and did. He gives us wisdom when we are willing to pray and listen. We have a lot of challenges and choices in life, but we can rely on God for strength and discernment. So let us pray. Dear God, thank you for giving us what we need. Help us to look to you for wisdom, to make good decisions, and to have discernment. Help us make wise choices in our lives. Thank you for your love. We love you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand again and sing with me? Guide me, thou, guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. The offertory invitation is taken from Eugene Peterson's translation of Luke 6, 38, where he translates Jesus saying, give away your life, you'll find life given back, but not merely given back, given back with bonus and blessing. Giving, not getting, is the way. Generosity begets generosity. With these words of our Lord in mind, let us worship now with the giving of our gifts to God.
Gracious God, you are the giver of all gifts. You have given us the gift of life, the gift of love, the gift of forgiveness, the gift of salvation. Open our hearts so that we will be more generous with our life, our love, and our forgiveness. As we give, share, and bless, we know that you will supply us with more than we can imagine. This is our prayer lifted through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And you may be seated. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from 1 Kings, the third chapter. And from that chapter, I'll read verses 5 through 14. So I invite you to listen. Listen for the word of God to you. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream. And God said, Ask for whatever you want me to give you. Solomon answered, You have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Now, Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. But I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, Since you have asked for this and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have you asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administering justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in obedience to me and keep my decrees and commands as David your father did, I will give you a long life. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And let us once again go to God in prayer. And as we do, I'll remind you of the prayer concerns printed on the back of the bulletin. Uh, we ask that you lift up and pray for Betty Hitchcock. Uh, she is going to have surgery on October the 12th. And Mac McNeil made it through his surgery. He is doing okay. Uh, he's still in the hospital. Maybe Nancy Beth was saying he might go home tomorrow, but lift him up and pray for him as he recovers from... And where is Nancy Beth? I will ask her. Probably still coming in. May have gone to the hospital. Uh, I think he had triple bypass surgery. The one you don't have, I mentioned earlier, uh, Patricia Pace uh, has COVID. And everybody else in the family, they all seem to be doing fine. Uh, but as I said, out of caution, Paula decided not to be here this morning. If there is someone you would like to let us know about, you're invited to say their name out loud as we first go to God silently in prayer. And then I will lead in the pastoral prayer. Let us go to God. Loving God, how much we need a good shepherd to guide us in life. We confess our strange mixture of feelings. We want guidance. We need it when the way is hard, when the night is long and dark, when so many bruises of life hurt us, 
And we rejoice that you stand as our shepherd, guarding and guiding. Yet we confess that we turn away from that good guidance so frequently. We know you guide us toward life. Yet we stubbornly go down paths that lead us far away from the green pastures and the still waters. We confess our strange inconsistency, pleading for your guidance with one breath and running from it with the next. Meet us where we are today, here, now. We are anxious and afraid. We're bitter and resentful. We hold grudges that we should have laid down long ago. We remember things that we should have forgotten and forget things we should remember and treasure. A good shepherd guide us away from these little valleys of death. Point us toward life. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The biggest difference from people who thrive in life and those who simply survive is probably not what you think. It's not usually the things we preoccupy ourselves with. It's not wealth, health, talent, ambition, appearance. Basically, it's wisdom. Being able on a consistent basis to make really good to great decisions because bad decisions can cost people their marriages their health their financial well-being their career and even their souls so how can we consistently now you're not always going to make great decisions but how can we consistently make really good decisions i read that the average person make 70 conscious decisions every day. Now, there are a lot of things we don't have to decide. We just do it because it's habit. Like, I didn't have to consciously decide whether I was going to come to church this morning. That is kind of like a given. If I don't come to church, I don't get paid. So it's not a big decision for me. But 70 conscious decisions every day. That is 25,500 decisions every year. And after about 70 years, that's 1,788,500 decisions. Yeah, so some of you have already passed that. Carlton and I, we've already passed that. Okay, what does that equal? What do all of those decisions equal? Your life. That's one thing a French philosopher said by the name of Albert Camus. Life is a sum of your choices. Your decisions determine your destiny. All of the decisions you have made up to this point, that has molded you, that has shaped you, that has made you who you are. So will the decisions you make from this day forward. So, how can we make consistently good decisions? I will go through my little list. See if my list coincides with your list. See if they're the same. Now, the first one you ought to get, because Duncan did a very good job, by the way, Duncan. Great job. He actually preached my sermon, so just kind of remember what I said. But where do we start? Well, okay, we're in church, so the place we naturally need to start, ask God for wisdom. Remember Duncan's sermon. There is a young man who all of a sudden was thrust upon a very big stage and he knew he was in over his head he didn't know what he was doing his name was 
Solomon. And he was given, he was king of a nation, a large nation, powerful nation, Israel. But not just that, he followed a great king, his father David, who absolutely everybody loved. How in the world is he going to fill those shoes? So, God appears to him one night in a dream, and he asks him a question. What do you want me to give you? Okay, and now Duncan did this with the kids, so you've had time to think about it. What if God came here this morning and looked at each one of you and said, I'll give you whatever you want, kind of like a magic genie in a bottle. I'm going to give you whatever you want. What do you want? What would your, don't, this is rhetorical, don't answer that. Because I'm going to say a Corvette, and that's the wrong answer what, the, what is the one thing more than anything else in the whole world that you want God to give you? What is it? Well, okay, you know the answer because of the children's sermon, or you better know the answer because of the children's sermon. I want you to pray this prayer. I want you to pray the prayer Solomon prayed. I want you to own it. I want you to mean it. I want you to ask God for this more than anything else. Because it will determine the rest of your life. If you didn't pray it before, you need to pray it now. It is never too late to pray this prayer. So pray this prayer with me. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. Now that is one of the things I wish every leader in our nation would pray every single morning. Every leader of the nation, every governor, every mayor, every elder in an individual church, every church member who is able to govern this great people of yours, pray for wisdom. We cannot do this on our own. Now the Lord, okay, this, let this really sink in. Think about this phrase. For the Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. Can you imagine just God kind of smiling and going, Yay, you gave the right answer. I am so pleased with you. Okay, think about this. Make it personal. You're a parent. And if you're not really, pretend you are. And tell your child, Rebecca, I'm going to give you anything you want. What do you want? Okay, and what does Rebecca say? Doesn't say candy, chocolate, Hershey's, Corvette. Doesn't say, you know, Dad, what I would like more than anything else is to know the difference between white and wrong. I would like to be able to discern that. I want to live as a person of integrity because I know this world is too big for me. I am in over my head. Remember the call to worship? Give us a heart of wisdom. Why? Because the days are evil. And that was written 2,000 years ago. Guess what? It hasn't changed. The days are still evil. There is a lot of evil around us. We need wisdom to make a distinction between right and wrong. God enabled me to live as a person of integrity. If you said that to your child, wouldn't that make you smile? You, you just figured it out. It took me 70 years to figure that out. You figured it out in your short life. Now, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. You ask, it will be given to you. Pay attention, you will get the answer. When you are searching for discernment, it will come to you. And we'll talk about how it comes to you a little bit later. And wisdom leads to godly character. When I pray to God, I ask God for lots of things, besides a Corvette. I ask God, and so do you, right? And I, I, I'm very specific because Max Lucado said I could be very specific in, in my prayers. And I can be very specific usually in my life. Should I take this job or not? Should I marry this person or not? Should I move here or should I move there? Well, 
God is much more concerned about the type of employee or employer you're going to be than the job you take or the job you have. He is much more concerned about the type of husband and the type of wife you're going to be in that marriage than he is the person you marry. Does that mean he doesn't care about the job you take or the person you marry? No, he does care. But he is much more concerned about who you are in that job, in that marriage, in this church, in whatever church you might go to. As one person said, God is not as concerned about where you end up in life as he is about the type of person you will be when you get there. It's about character and integrity. And if you have wisdom, what happened to what happened to Solomon when he said he didn't ask for wealth or long life or honor? What happened? What did God give him? All of those things. If you ask for wisdom, you will make wise choices on a consistent basis and you will be financially secure. You'll make wise decisions about your finances. You'll make wise decisions about your health. And so you will live longer. There are a lot of things that flow from that decision. It is talking about character. Philippians 2 Five, in relationship with one another, what are we supposed to be like? Like Christ. Have the same mindset in your marriage, in your church, in your job. Have that same mindset as Christ Jesus. Do we do that? Rhetorical? Okay, we need to speak the truth in love. Why? So read this with me. So we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head. That is Christ. That is our goal, and we need wisdom to discern how Christ would respond, would relate in all these different situations. Okay, ask for godly, ask for guidance from God. Also pray for a peaceful mind. And this is, and I've shared this with you before, when I have to make very difficult decisions after I make them, that's what I pray for. Peace. Help me not just to keep going back and going, I wonder if, or if only, or why didn't I. Just give me a peaceful mind. Now, I read, and it was John Maxwell. Actually, he said this in a seminar I attended, and he's talking to a bunch of pastors but never make a major decision in a down cycle. And the illustration he gave, if you're angry or upset, said never resign from your church on Monday after a bad session meeting on Sunday. Wait a week. <laughs> Wait, just think about what the situation is really like. If you go, if you're having a hard time at work and all of a sudden you get it into it with your boss, don't all of a sudden out of the heat of the moment because you're angry, shout out, I quit. Take this job and shove it. Wait a week. <laughs> all because the next day you may be going, what was I thinking? Now I have no job, no income and no place to go. Don't do anything when you're operating out of the emotional part of the brain. Wait until you're operating out of the rational, logical, problem-solving part of the brain. Pray for a peaceful mind before, not just after, but before you make major decisions. Anxiety and exhaustion equal bad decisions. They will also say, never make a decision uh, while you're grieving, when you're depressed, and they will tell people, and you've lost somebody you love through death or divorce. What do they say? Because I've shared this with you before. Don't make a major decision for at least a year. If you're still grieving, wait two years. Because you're operating out of the emotional part of the brain. You're looking for a quick fix to make you feel better because you feel horrible. Wait until you don't feel horrible. You don't need somebody else or something else to make you feel better. And they say, don't move after you've lost somebody you love within the first year. 
You cannot run away from the grief. It will follow you. And anxiety and exhaustion equal bad decisions as well. If you're worn out, if you're tired, and I'm going to read something in just a minute. But what is the antidote for this? All of you in the Wednesday night study, you know the antidote, and we're going to read it together from Paul. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. If you do that, you lift it up, you give it to God. Here, you keep it. I'm not going to take it back. What's going to happen? What will be the result if you do that? You will experience a peace that transcends all understanding. Because you have done this, you're not just giving it. You are thanking God for the blessings you have in your life, for His presence in your life, and His ability to guide you through these difficult times and to always be with you. Now here is, this is a quote, and this is from Lyle Schaller. Was he United Methodist? I can't, that was in my mind. John Maxwell was Wesleyan. I'm doing that for all of you who got smart and joined our church. Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. You should never say something like that on YouTube. That was a, I love United Methodist. I do. I, I'm just, I was kidding. Uh, but this is from... I said, survival, I said, consistently make good decisions. That was not a good decision. But even Solomon messed up. This is from Survival Tactics in the Parish. It's, it's for pastors, but okay, it relates. Get plenty of sleep. How would you like to improve your productivity at work? Do you want to be a better spouse and parent? How about problem solving? Would you like to see solutions where other people see problems? Get plenty of sleep. We live in a world where experts tell us we have a sleep debt bigger than the national debt. Lack of sleep causes people to argue with spouses and friends, do subpar work, and be less loving and more irritable. It's hard to live like Jesus if you're sleep deprived. You get cranky, don't you, Nancy Beth? Yeah, see... Have, number two, have a clear sense of self-identity. Who or what defines you? If it's anything other than God, you're in trouble. Does your job define you? Or how much money you make? Or the car you drive? All of that can be taken away. Are you still trying to please your parents even though you're 60 years old and they're gone? How about your friends? What other people think matters, but it shouldn't matter too much. Remember the saying, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. Three, ignore trifling diversions. Uh, Robert McCain said, the reason most major goals are not achieved is that we spend our time doing second things first. A headline told of 300 whales that suddenly died. The whales were chasing sardines and found themselves marooned in a bay. The small fish lured the sea giants to their death. They came to their violent demise by using their great power for insignificant goals. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. So what is God's will for you today? Are we trying to keep the main thing the main thing? And do you know know what the main thing is? And being drained and depressed can be deadly. And I don't think I really need to explain this. I talked about this. Well, I talked about about Elijah and Jezebel. Remember a few weeks ago? Remember Elijah just performed a lot of miraculous things, powerful things, called down fire from heaven, burned up the offering. He wiped out, what, 400 prophets of Baal. Did he outrun a chariot? Okay, then he finds out that Jezebel is not happy with him because he killed her prophets. So he said, what you did to my prophets, I'm going to do to you. So, whoa, he is scared. He is anxious. He is worn out. He is tired. He is depressed. How do I know he was depressed? Where did he go? He sat down under a broom tree and said, what? 
just take my life. I have had it. This is over. Now, I know that none of you have ever felt that way. You're tired. Yeah. yeah, I've been there a couple of times. You're tired. You're depressed. You go, I, I would just rather not be alive. I would rather die. There are individuals, and we all know, individuals who have decided in those dark valleys to end their life. So what was the prescription given to him by God? Sleep. Rest. And he slept for a long time. God woke him up. Then what did he do? Fed him. He said, go back to sleep. <laughs> After 40 days of rest and food and talking with God, guess what? He was no longer depressed. He was no longer drained. He was ready to go. He believed there was a future ahead of him. When you're down, when you're depressed, make wise decisions. Make wise choices. Consider the consequences. What's going to happen? Don't be short-sighted. And a lot of people look for a quick fix along the way. What is going to make me feel good right now instead of what is best for me in the long term? And, and an easy illustration of that, I think most people in, in the United States, we have a tendency to live right at our our means, our financial ability. We buy a house, and we can make the house payment, but it's at the top of our budget. We buy a car, and it's in. We can make the payment. It's right at the top of our budget. We like vacations, and we save for our vacations, but we don't save for anything else because the house, the car, our style of life has taken everything. We live from paycheck to paycheck. It is great now. It is wonderful now. But what's going to happen one day when you decide you really don't want to work anymore and you don't have any money saved up? What is going to happen? Don't be short-sighted. Consider the consequences. And I could give you <clears throat> a lot of other illustrations. Um, in illustrations from marriage, but hopefully you can come up with your own illustrations. What might like good, what might look good at the moment will be deadly later on. Think about the decisions you're making. Proverbs 12, 15. Desire, and we all have desires, we all have wants, we all have wishes without knowledge, without thinking about it, without paying attention and asking for wisdom is not good. How much more will hasty feet miss the way. Rash decisions, quick decisions, without taking the time to think about the consequences that they will have. What do you value the most? And are you paying attention to those things? And what should we value the most? Store up your treasure where? Jesus said, where should we store up our treasure? In heaven. What is he talking about? relationships. Start paying attention to your relationship with God, your relationship with the people you love, you care about, your relationship with all people, and your relationship with yourself. Are you living with integrity? Are you living with wisdom? Are you paying attention? It's not that the other things are bad. They're good, and they're wonderful. In the right place, in the right priority, don't make them idols. Don't worship them. And if you've got a major decision to make, and some of you may be facing a major decision, seek wise counsel. Don't try to do this on your own. Try to find somebody, and I think you need godly counsel, and that's because I'm a pastor, <laughs> and I just think that's kind of important, because you can get some really bad counsel. And there's a lot of bad advice floating around out there. Find one or two people you really trust and consider to be wise spiritually and talk to them. Pay attention to what they say. Now, God speaks to us in a lot of ways. And, and he speaks to us through his word, which Duncan mentioned. You listen to God's word. He can speak to it through music, on a Sunday morning or music you listen to on the radio. Some of you like music we don't sing here, but on Christian music on the radio, God will speak through that. But also, one of the ways 
And God speaks to me in both those ways, through nature. The way he speaks to me most often is through you, through people. And you may not even know that you've been an answer to my prayer by something you said. And I'll go, oh yeah, that, that I won't tell you. <laughs> Probably. Well, maybe now I will. But you don't know how you bless other people's lives. But also, other people can bless your life if you're listening, if you're paying attention to what they say. Now, we're all foolish. Even Solomon was foolish. In Proverbs 12, 15, the way a fool seems wise to them, but the wise listen to advice. <laughs> okay, this is another one of those that I shouldn't mention. Look at Robert. But, okay, I'll look at Chris. It's like, I was 20 years old and I had a major decision to make. I did not ask my parents' advice if I should join the Marine Corps. I didn't ask their advice because I knew what they would say. <laughs> There's a war going on. We don't want you going. So, but it seemed right to me. I was absolutely convinced that was the right thing to do. But the wise listen to advice. Even Solomon wasn't always wise. Here we go. 1 King 11, 3 and 4. He had 700 wives of royal birth. Well, I'm glad they were of royal birth. And 300 concubines. I don't know what kind of birth they had. But if you do not have 700 husbands or wives, you're already wiser than Solomon, who in their right mind would have a thousand wives running around in a palace. I'd, now that was accepted at that time, but I still don't think it was a good idea. But why was it really a bad idea for Solomon? I mean, I think that's a bad idea in and of itself. But why for Solomon? His wives led him astray. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father had been. Seek wise counsel. Seek people who can guide you in the right direction. And then the last thing I'm going to say is then make the decision. Don't sit around and think about it forever. Don't get paralyzed. Well, that's an interesting spelling. Hey. Blake, why did you put that up there? <laughs> Blake doesn't do the slides. I, I do them. Yeah, well, that was a bad decision. But <laughs> I said let Blake do all of the slides. Don't get paralyzed by decisions. Oh, a decidophobia is a real word, by the way, that a psychologist came I'm not kidding. Psychologists came up with this, I don't know, 20, 25 years ago people can't make a decision have you ever gone to the store and have been able to make a decision on deodorant toothpaste i mean they have a thousand how many different brands of coffee can you make you could sit there forever so i would kind of drive you nuts now there are two styles of decision making there are maximizers and satisfiers these are extremes and i'm going to say don't do the one of these maximizers if they go to the grocery store, they will look at every single one of those different brands of coffee, every single one of those different toothpaste brands. They will go through every conceivable option before they make a decision. Satisfiers, they will just see one and go, that looks good, take it, I'm fine. The bar is really, really low. A study showed that maximizers, when they're going to get a job, they spend all their due diligence, they're going to, you know, research the job, all of the job, which one pays more. And they, in general, make 20% more than satisfiers who just take the first job that is given to them. Yep, that'll work, that is fine. But they are more unhappy with their jobs than the satisfiers. Now, hopefully you realize the best place is between the two, don't set the bar so low that you're just satisfied with anything. But don't set it so high that you're never going to be happy with your decision because you'll never know if it's the perfect decision. And perfection can create great anxiety in people. Sometimes, you know, you have to lower the bar just a little bit. And then 
make the decision. Well, okay, start today. Think about the decisions you have to make. At the end of the day, like at the end of today, think about the decisions you've made. And think about were there any choices you made that you regret after any day. Okay, do what it says in Philippians. Give it to God. Place all of your anxieties on Him. Don't sit there and cause it to keep you up all night long wondering if you'd made the right or the wrong decision. Just give it to God and leave it there and you will find peace with the decision. And then thank God for all the right decisions. Always end with that one. With the right decisions you made, like coming to church. <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming this was a good decision. And as you leave, you go, bad decision. Think about the blessings you receive during the day. It is, you know the song, Count Your Blessings? Let that be the last thing you do, and you will find peace as you sleep. When you get up in the morning, and maybe go through Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Ask God to guide you through the day and all the decisions you're going to have to make. So ask God for wisdom. Pray for a peaceful mind before and after. Consider the consequences of the decisions you're going to make. And then be comfortable in the decision that you make. Now I want us to pray. And again, we're going to go back and pray this again, the prayer that Solomon prayed to God. Again, make this your prayer. Pray this with me. So give your servant a discerning heart and to distinguish between right and wrong. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let us now affirm our faith. And we're going to do it by reading together Proverbs 3, 13 through 17, 21 through 25 and 35. Who wrote Proverbs? Solomon. Would you stand as we affirm our faith together? <coughs> Blessed are those who find wisdom, those who gain understanding, for she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand. In her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways, and all her paths are peace. My children, do not let wisdom and understanding out of your sight. Preserve sound judgment and discretion. They will be life for you, an ornament of grace around your neck. Then you will go on your way in safety, and your foot will not stumble. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. The wise inherit honor, but fools get only shame. My invitation to you I gave at the end of the sermon tonight. Go to God, thank Him. The last thing you need to do, thank Him for the ways in which He's blessed you today. And think about if you're married, your family, your kids. Just say a quick prayer for each one of them and thank God for them. And as you get up in the morning, ask God to give you wisdom and discernment as you go through whatever you have to go through that day. And I also extend the invitation if there's anyone here who has not surrendered their life to Christ and if you have felt 
uh, the movement of God's Spirit. If you'd like to profess your faith publicly, and you may do it privately, if you'd like to do it publicly, you're invited to do that as we sing the first three verses of Be Thou My Vision. Now may God's love give you confidence and his truth give you direction. May God's eternalness give you peace and hope this day and all of your days. Amen. <laughs>